Well, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, first in a series of video posts hosted by Into Ceramics. In future editions, we're going to be speaking to people from across the mineral processing and ceramics industries, getting their take on what's important, important trends, emerging technologies, things like that. But today we're going to kick the series off by interviewing and introducing the founders of Into Ceramics, Brian Geary and Carl Sorrell, and finding out what makes them tick and where they're headed with the Into Ceramics business. Uh, I'm Matt Bell with Strategic Peace. It's my pleasure to uh, MC today's conversation. Uh, quick reminder before we get started, if you like the episodes, like it on YouTube, leave us a comment there on the YouTube page, and please follow the Into Ceramics channel. That way we can keep you posted when future editions are, are getting published. All right, well, without further ado, let's kick it off uh, with a couple of softballs. Um, I guess there's questions for both of you, but Brian, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how did you get started in the ceramics industry? Oh, thanks, Matt. So I'm Brian Geary. I'm the president of Into Ceramics and OPF Enterprises. You know, my career in the ceramics was something that was more or less by uh, maybe needed to be intentional, but was more or less an accident. I, as a youngster just graduating high school, needed to decide what to do with my life. And I grew up in a small town in Tennessee and was working at a local grocery store there. And of course, family, my dad worked at a consolidated aluminum company for 40 plus years. And my oldest brother, Mark, was working at a machine shop in a ceramic tile factory. So the tendency tended to be in that area with the family that, hey, you need to get a job in a factory and learn some skill set. So I interviewed both at my dad's place with the personnel manager to do aluminum. And I interviewed with my uh, brother's personnel manager at the tile company to try to get in the tile operation. And about two weeks later, I got paged at the store and said, hey, someone's on the phone for you. And it was personnel manager of American Only in Tile. And they offered me a job. And I accepted and said, yep, I got to make a little bit of extra income to figure out how to pay for college and things like that. And uh, then an hour later, the personnel manager of the aluminum company called and offered me a job. So I said, sorry, I'd already taken a job at the tile plant. So 20 years later at the tile plant, if that phone call had been reversed, I often think that maybe my career would have been making aluminum or metallurgical or something of that nature. We'd but be sitting here talking about metals instead. It, very true. Very true. So. That's how my career started off. Started out in a tile operation, working any shift and any job they wanted me to do while I went to college and just got really involved in the operation from the side of R&D and development and color science. And then ended up uh, being very integrated in production with engineering and equipment and just uh, lived that manufacturing life for, uh, for many years. Nice. How about you, Carl? Were you a, a ceramics guy from the age of two? Uh, just about. Uh, my father was a college professor. His PhD was in geology. So it was always earth science. It was like, okay, you're four years old. You're big enough to screen material in the laboratory. Okay. So I, I grew up with a, a great interest in that. And he made the leap from teaching geology to teaching mineralogy and ceramic engineering at the University of Missouri at about the time I entered high school. So it was always assumed I was going to go to college. but I didn't really want to be a ceramic engineer until I found out that was at the time the highest paying engineering field out there. I mean, we beat aerospace, chemical, the whole shebang. So both my brother and I, who was two years younger than I am, decided we would we would go into ceramic engineering. And I will say to those people whose parents are college professors, don't do that. Don't have your parent be one of your professors. It's not a good experience. But <laughs> nevertheless, I struggled through and disappointed my father once, once again because he assumed I was going to go to graduate school, which my brother eventually did, and he became a professor of ceramic engineering. But I said, no, nah, I've, I've had 18 years of being on a college campus. I need to go work for a living. And so... I interviewed just like everybody else, and I ended up working in Seattle, which was a wonderful place to start a career, uh, working for a refractory brick company and uh, stayed in manufacturing all these years. So as you moved up through the industry, what was your favorite position? What did you, uh, what did you enjoy the most? Well, for me, it was certainly on the uh, R&D side. I, 
latched on the color science pretty hard and and got trained in that and spent some time around the globe actually getting training and it just became you know passionate about it became a person that was really good at developing colors and this was in the era of computers were just starting to be the technology that that drove things from a manufacturing side so i was of the generation that latched on that real quick and and just became kind of a a go-to guy at, at developing products from formulations to, to colors. And, and that also gave me tons of time on the plant floor because working in the lab, you don't just spend all your time as a mad scientist. You're actually held accountable to say, oh, does this actually work in the factory? So if anything went wrong with the product, they call the guy and say, it's your fault. So from there, I, I got to spend a lot of time on the plant floor. And that really became something that was just super passionate, both to crawl and myself both was just living that life of making products every day and and chasing the manufacturing ghost if you will to to troubleshoot and working with all the various complex personalities to get a product from point a to point b so that was my favorite anyway was just on the development side for me it was pretty much the opposite of brian after being in college campuses and labs for so many years what I really enjoyed was working with people and working with equipment. So as a, I, I was a plant manager for many years, I got to build a lot of stuff and work with a lot of people. And to this day, there's nothing like a well-oiled factory machine running. I mean, it's just one of the most fun places on the planet to be, which tells you something about me, I guess. Call the well-oiled machine. So I guess that begs the question of both of you. Was there a point in time where you realized you wanted to get out of that and into consultancy or was that another kind of serendipity thing? I'll start on this one. So I've kind of always had an entrepreneurial spirit back even in my college days. I started a computer business in a small town of Tennessee. I grew up in became the local nerd that was going around and fixing everybody's problems and, and working day and night on that. And, uh, for, for many years, Carl and I worked together in manufacturing in various companies and plants around the globe. And I had been telling him probably for 10 years prior to us starting on the plant floor, OPF Enterprises, that, hey, we need to do something. We need to do something. Of course, at that stage, we kind of had to go in handcuffs. We were working in corporate and, and it was just a challenge to get out of that field or that lane, if you will. But I think the pinnacle was when we finally did a startup company, I went to Carl and said, Carl, it, it's apparent that I just can't work for anybody else any longer. So I'm going to do this with you or without you. So put your big boy pants on and let's <laughs> let's do this more or less. All right, Carl, what's your version of the story? Yeah, it's not quite that dramatic, uh, but uh, it it. it it's very similar. I mean, Brian and I had been working together since 2001. So we're talking at this time, 2010, we'd been together nine years and working over three different locations and two different companies. So we got to the point where we really just couldn't see doing something without the other, but we knew that that was unlikely in corporate. So yeah, I guess, I guess Brian did bring me dragging and kicking into the consultant business and uh, I've never regretted it. Awesome. Well, well, we'll come back to the on the plant floor bit. And, you know, you obviously both came up through manufacturing and plant management, but let's talk a little bit more about what you're doing today. I mean, why the focus on mineral waste streams in particular? Well, it, it was something that we wanted to start a new division last year, both out of passion and out of diversity. We realized that the market had really changed in some of the segments we worked in and we needed more flexibility and, and more avenues, if you will, to create growth potential. We had done various waste stream projects down through the years, but we never really marketed ourselves in that space. It was simply by word of mouth. It would be that someone sent a material to a company or to a research center or university and said, hey, what is this and what do we do with it? And, you know, as a testing lab or university, you pretty much provide the data without guidance of what the potential is. So a lot of those places would know Carl or I and they would say, hey, this is interesting. Here's what the data shows. But these guys at, at OPF really might find a way to help you commercialize it or find viable products for it. So after that happened multiple times, Carl and I said, you know what, 
let's don't really rebrand ourselves. We've still got a good place and brand with OPF Enterprises, and that's something we want to continue to do. But let's have a passion and a focus on this waste stream outlet because we dealt with it all our careers in manufacturing. There was not a plant you, you manage that you're not dealing with waste and the potential to have excessive costs from landfills, from environmental issues, and, and just the overall impact. But we also knew that while it was something that was critical and needed to be done, it's not something we could internally put a lot of time and effort into it, even if it was a corporate mandate, because you're, you're running production. You've got product, customers, quality, personnel, safety, everything in the world going on. So it tended to hit the back burner mm -hmm. until it became a critical mass that someone said, you absolutely have to address this. So we knew that coming into that lane that we could offer expertise that might be outside of what a particular plant was developing or what they're producing every day. With our broad ranges of experience around the globe, we've touched a lot of materials, a lot of different products. And even back in the days of Carl and I making tile, brick, sanitary wear, we just didn't have as much vision into other lanes of, okay, if we can't repurpose this and put it back in our process, then what value does it hold? Without being able to say, hey, it may actually go into a complete different company, a complete right. different product. And now we've had that exposure over the last 10 or 12 years of, of, of doing lots of things that we think we bring that to the table as well to clients that may be focused just on what they do. Also, I did is what you asked previously about consulting. We seriously struggled with that term. Uh, I was like, Carl, what are we going to call ourselves? Are we really going to say we're consultants? Because in our lives, we've had, uh, unfortunately, some not too pleasant experience with consultants driven by corporate mandates of, hey, we're sending these guys in. You guys are not getting the job done. They're going to tell you what to do. And and we learned early that there's a thin line between consulting and insult to where anybody can be a master of the obvious and come into an operation and leave a laundry list of action items and then deliver it to corporate and ride off into the sunset. So our approach is, has been strategic not to assume that a very talented staff with years of experience of running an operation that we're going to walk in and flip some magic switch that they would have already found themselves. So our goal when we go into an operation is certainly to value the opinions of, of the personnel there, plant management, supervisors, lab staff, and to just bring a different perspective with our experience of some things that it may not be the magic switch, but it may add value to that potential they've already created. Yeah, that's a great point. I know you guys have talked about it elsewhere. Sometimes it's just telling them no, not yes, helping them uh, see that an opportunity isn't going to work as well. I mean, you mentioned potential uh, a few moments ago. How big do you think this opportunity is for turning waste minerals into ceramics? And I'm going to assume you're going to say it's large. So as a quick follow on, why haven't people focused on it? Is it, is it just that they don't have the time of day or the expertise? Well, I'll add a little bit more of that than Carl can comment. But, but again, just personalizing it and taking it from our experience, we had retaining ponds, we had landfills, we had things that we knew were huge obstacles from a cost standpoint, from an environmental standpoint that we were constantly dealing with. I can't tell you how many times in some of the settling ponds we would have we were paying once every three or four years for, for groups to come in with huge excavation equipment to dig out these ponds to dispose of them just so for the next four or five years, we'd have enough room to put the same stuff back in there. But we just couldn't get our arms around it. I mean, finding the plant and everything that goes on with making products and new products and turnover and, and just the life of a, a plant manager, we've often said is the hardest job in the world. You just don't have the internal resources or the time to put into those efforts. So our thought process going into it was we're going to bring two key driving elements to provide success to clients. Our broad range of experience with other materials outside the space that potentially you have not even considered. And we're going to bring that outside support to take on the burden of doing the work that you don't have the bandwidth or the resources to supply 
and we're going to be boots on the ground. I mean, the reason we named our company on the plant floor and into ceramics is we're not office guys. We'll go fight the battles on the front line and we will certainly help get the work done and we won't walk away and say, here, here's all the stuff you got to do to uh, make this successful. We'll be there to uh, help guide that. So, Carl, what do you think? I mean, how, how big is this opportunity um, for turning waste into, into ceramics? You know, from my perspective, which is very similar to Brian's, um, this started for me a long, long time ago. Uh, back in the day, I was a ceramic engineer and plant superintendent at, at a brick plant. And we did our own mining. We mined yellow clay, we mined white clay, and we mined red clay, and we made buff, white, red, and brown brick just like many, many plants do. And we had these huge stockpiles of excess material because we would go after the best clay and discard the rest. And so it got to the point that we had mountains of this stuff. And the mining engineer and I got together and said, you know, nobody's really sampled these piles. Why don't, why don't we sample these piles and see what we can do with them? So we took about six months to do that. And the mining program ended for five years. We had enough material on the ground as waste to supply the plant for five years. And that, to this day, is one of the most satisfying projects I ever worked on. And so this has always been a part of my career. And you asked, though, you know, why aren't people concentrating on this? Up until now, they haven't really had to, unless you have been a mining company where you've had a tailing storage facility failure and or an environmental disaster. It just don't it doesn't really come into play up until now. But as we go into the the green uh, revolution, uh, electric vehicles, windmills, uh, photovoltaics, uh, the, the increasing digital uh, rev revolution, infrastructure. These are all going to require enormous amounts of relatively uncommon materials, lithium, borate, boron, uh, graphite, you name it. And we're going to have to exploit a whole lot of earth and minerals to get these materials, which is going to generate even more waste. And now we see that the, uh, the European uh, community is taking an active lead in that. There are some U.S. government initiatives. I think they're a little, little late, but they're coming. But it's going to be a huge pressure on materials. And what are you going to do with those materials that are left over after you extract what you're looking for? So I think that the waste recycling, waste recovery is just going to become enormous. And if you couple that with the fact that we're running out of sand, we're running out of sand, literally, that is useful for building aggregates. The, the pressure on these things are enormous. So we may see a huge move. What I, what I anticipate happening is we'll see a huge move into manufactured materials to take place uh, uh, at a lower cost, some of these more common materials like uh, aggregate. So do I need to be sitting on a, a mine heap sized pile of waste or is a few trucks with the waste enough to worth worrying about? Well, that's certainly always a challenge. I mean, sometimes being on the formulation side for so many years and the development size, you're going to be reformulating to some degree to put a new material into the operation. And if that reformulation, if you will, is short term, it could upset the process for a while till you get it dialed in. And then you run out of it again and have to go back to formula A, so to speak. So that's often a challenge if you don't have enough material. On the other side is if you've got these huge volumes of waste stream materials, the time to develop that or to shed off those materials could, could be years, not making the immediate return seem satisfactory enough. You know, it could be that you can only get 10% of this waste stream material back into your formulation or into company A, B, or C that logistically is favorable. And of course, logistics drive everything. We've often said that you could have something of, of high use to a client and you could just say, come get it. It's free. But 
if the trucking cost and the logistics doesn't work out, then it still becomes a mute point, so to speak. So I think on the low side, again, it's limitation of wanting to upset the process. On the high side, from the company that has the waste stream, it's be like, oh, wow, we can only move a couple of truckloads of this a month. This is going to take 20 years. So it, it can be a challenge on both sides. I guess as a follow on to that, what do you think an ideal client for into ceramics looks like? Is there such a thing? Well, again, from our perspective, having faced these scenarios, we, we tend to look at it as someone that's reached critical mass for sure. I mean, you're faced with landfill costs. Maybe the landfill has put new restrictions on what you can bring to their facility or they've increased the dumping cost. That's a great example of, hey, we really are at a point where something has to happen. Another example would be, as I mentioned previously, they just have got in this series of, we're going to move this stockpile from this side of the property to this side of the property. And then we're going to move it back over to this side of the property. So they're just spending a lot of time and, and resources and, and finances on just moving around material to make room for other material. So those are ideal clients, as well as a client that may not realize logistically what other consumers could be, if not in their backyard, at least within a radius that still makes sense because they thought to themselves, well, as Carl mentioned, sand. Well, we're using sand and, and brick. We're using sand and tile, and we call silica, but sand at the end of the day. And they don't realize that the bottling plant down the road doesn't need premium grade sand because they're making off color type bottling, amber or green type color. And they could really use a sand that's not as pure, but left hand doesn't talk to the right hand. And, and we're just able to say, hey, you know what? This is ideal for the glass industry or the bottling industry. Let's see who may be in that area that holds some logistic favors. And we just start formulating through company A to company B and, and working the two sides together where they both have a win-win scenario. So tell me about a typical project. I mean, you, you talk about phased activities when you described your company. What, what are the typical phases that a project will go through and why is it necessary to break it up like that? We go through what's called what we call stage gate um, phases. And meaning that if we don't get past the gate at stage one, there is no stage two. And it builds from there. And the first part of this, the first part or phase one is where we do the investigation. And that investigation can be mineralogical, it can be chemical, it can be logistic, it can be anything to disqualify the project. What we're really looking for in the beginning is, and we operate on the tenant that a, that a quick no is a lot better than a drawn out no. So we, we look to find things wrong. What, what will prevent us from doing something? So once we go through the analytical and chemical testing, also in phase one, we will do physical testing for, we will say, okay, this material A has a potential for product B, C, D, E, and so on. And we will formulate in our laboratory to do laboratory scale. We'll test physical properties and say, this looks pretty good. If we get to the pretty good or yes stage, then we'll go on to a phase two, which will involve in-depth marketing. It will involve processing materials at a pilot scale um, and qualifying the project on a this really looks good basis just before we go into the final stage, which and if we pass all the pilot scale tests, we will then go to a full scale build out, sell, venture, whatever the client wants us to do in terms of building for them or building a business for them. In other words, we'll take it from laboratory concept to pilot scale to full scale cost with detailed CapEx, OpEx, environmental information, everything required to build a factory. And at that point, it's the client's uh, decision on whether or not they want to do that or whether they want to sell the concept, joint venture with somebody uh, on, a, on, a, on a business level that is uh, we have advised them on. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Carl. And Matt, as you know, one of the things that 
we pride ourselves on is we do have two R and D and development labs in Houston, Texas, to where in ceramics we can take things from, as Carl said, from the raw materials, the mineral concept, through all the analytical work to development to R and D to pilot scale and things of that nature. I think another unique thing about on the plant four and into ceramics is. We really do not have a vision of creating the world's greatest 100 grams in a laboratory and a company getting 20 versions of IP on it and propping herself up to do something with IP. Our vision is creating commercialization products at large scale manufacturing that through all of these stages and gates, we're continually de-risking what we call the manufacturing monster. We don't want to introduce something, especially into a ceramic world where you're fighting the kill every day or the kill has such a narrow firing range that plus or minus 10 degrees is upsetting the process. Our goal along the way is to continually de-risk it, to make something robust enough that can handle the manufacturing variation that you're going to see every day. Also, while if we get to the final phases, as Carl mentioned, that it's time to consider commercialization or JV or what do we do with this company? Oftentimes, we will have to advise groups that, look, you're a great research group, but you're not a manufacturing team. And the IRR to justify some of this nature may not be the appetite. So let us find you a partner that can actually be a toll manufacturer that we hand off the product to. We help manage. We help design and get the product going while we also find resources to do the sales and marketing side of it. Because it's not just a great idea or a great development that equals success in large scale manufacturing. It's bringing the right partnerships in. Some of this is about who you know, not just what you know. Yes, sir. So I get how that, you know, we've talked a lot about mines and, and manufacturing and processing plants, which are obviously, you know, where, where you guys have come from. We do a lot of work with them. You also talk about helping consultants to bring this kind of thinking and, and, and waste to product development into the market. How do, you, how do you envision partnering with them? What do you bring to that business? Well, I, I, I think there are a couple of things to look at as far as consultants go. And consultants can be extremely knowledgeable. But unless they're ceramic, unless they're trained as ceramic engineers or ceramic scientists, they're going to be like most people. When, when you say ceramics to people, people think dinnerware, they, they think tile and they think toilet bowls. And that's really what the general public thinks ceramics is. But it's such a huge area of, of very highly technical products. Uh, glass, for example, nobody thinks of glass as ceramics. And indeed, they aren't ceramics, but ceramic engineers are very involved in glass formulation all the way. It's all about mineral processing. So what we can bring to the consultant is number one, we can educate them on the different potentials of a certain product or process. Can you turn it into an onion product A or product B, product C? Additionally, we're very familiar with ceramic manufacturing principles as well as the equipment involved and what it takes to actually build an operation. So we can be to a general consultant or a business consultant, we can be the process go-to guys as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Carl. And you know, Matt, in your career and ours too, there's very large consulting firms out there that have huge brand power and, and a lar large base globally to, to take on a lot of products and a lot of projects. We see ourselves a lot of times aligning with these groups that don't have the specific expertise in the ceramic lane that we do. Right. Maybe part of the project they've taken on involves they need some development work. They need some laboratories. They need specific expertise in this arena that may not be in-house. That's where we'd love to plug in and partner with them to bring our expertise to the table even if it's a small piece of the pie, we're a group that can add a lot more immediate value and help make the overall project be successful by our role. Carl, just want to pick back up on something you said there, because I, you know, I'm part of that general public that probably thought ceramic was brick tile and toilets. What are other examples of industrial ceramics we should be thinking about here that would be the end product of this kind of process? Well, we we could think we could think of many different 
different uh, products. One that comes to mind is refractories. There's huge interest in, in recycling strategic minerals for refractories. And by refractories, I mean, I mean heat resistant linings. I mean the things that were on the space shuttle in the early days, the tiles. I mean, what's inside a steel label, what's inside a foundry molten uh, ladle, what, what, is, what lines all furnaces, refractories. Mm -hmm. There are very specific refractory compositions that are needed and only certain materials can fill that, come to mind, chrome and magnesia. Um, you also have, uh, uh, quite frankly, when you get right down to it, uh, the silicon chip is a ceramic material. Uh, so there are huge, huge, huge electronic ceramic uh, requirements uh, for capacitance, resistance, very specific electrical requirements. But also on, on a more common basis, aggregates, lightweight aggregates that are manufactured, uh, dense aggregates that are manufactured. These are these are increasingly becoming more accepted in the building world and. As Brian likes to say, I mean, there's not been a skyscraper over three stories built in the last 50 years that hasn't been made of lightweight, con lightweight concrete using a uh, manufactured aggregate, whether it, whether it's a slag, an ash, or an expanded shale or, or slate. And those are just a few of the, of the uh, examples that I can think of right off the top of my head. That's a good point. You know, years ago, Matt, we were very involved with ceramics related to the oil field. And before that time, Carl and I had done lots and lots of things around the globe. But until I got into Houston, Texas and started getting approached about, well, hey, we got ceramics in oil and gas, too. Can you guys do something there? We really hadn't touched that space. And then for the next three or four years, that's about the only space we touched, frankly. And we developed a great expertise in that around the globe. And here lately in the last year, I'd say, as Carl mentioned, with lightweight aggregates, it was another product we had knowledge of. We knew it existed with clays and shells and some other materials, but we just haven't spent a lot of time in that space. And now with the infrastructure bills that are in place and all the road developments and the continuing construction around the, the, the U.S. especially, it's just an increase in demand that is certainly driving existing manufacturers and potentially new players in the market to dedicate resources to that space, knowing that there's room for growth. And, and that's a space we continue to see ourselves in, both getting very creative with the fundamentals of, of clay and man-made type aggregates, as well as it is an ideal category for waste stream materials. We're finding the ability to take local waste streams from multiple sources to get it into those lightweight aggregate operations that brings true value from the entire area. And as Carl mentioned earlier, so construction's going up, we're running out of natural materials, including sand, and then we've got the whole environmental uh, circular economy type uh, driver going on as well. Sounds like you know, some pretty virtuous combinations there for you guys. Let's talk a little bit about the people side. I mean, you You've worked in this industry for a long time. So what's your biggest frustration working with people in the industry? What do you wish they would know or do differently? Well, I tell you, one of the things that has occurred multiple, multiple times since we started the businesses over 10 years ago is we're often sought out later than sooner. And we have to be careful that we don't come into a later to stage development and get labeled automatically Dr. No, because sometimes they've taken a path that's perhaps not going to lead to true return on investment or is not scalable. They've done something from a laboratory side, as I mentioned, that looks very attractive. And we come in and see how they've done that and think in our world, in our mind, okay, we build this factory, cost $50 million, you've got to make 250,000 tons a year, how does this scale? Or the equipment that's required to make this product is something so exotic that you have no experience with it. So we love to get in on the early stage, meaning a company, start with the materials, Carl mentioned. Maybe you don't even have the analytical data that's needed to, to fully get to the true nature of this mineralogy or chemistry of the material. We can certainly assist with that. 
if we get on an early stage, we're often able to guide that ship much more down a less treacherous path, if you will, and something that's going to have uh, a greater return on investment. Or as Carl mentioned, we do certainly operate at a high level of integrity and we have no desire to, for companies to, to get frustrated by death by R&D, I call it. Oh, what if we could do this? And what if we could do that? We're more about what's this look like commercializing? What's this look like in a full blown factory? How do you run this operation every day? And can you make a margin that makes sense doing it? So for me, that's been the frustration is coming in late stage instead of early stage. Yeah, I, 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 and that's a very good point. I mean, you always want to be in on the early stage so that you can, you can lend a sense of reality to some of the R and D uh, uh, people. And I love R and D people, but, they're not the ones that have to go out and operate the machines every day in the factory, like like people like Brian and myself and uh, and a machine operator will. So they 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 look at it from a very different viewpoint. If we can get in, as Brian says, early enough, we can help shade that viewpoint and and reality. I, we I think one of the best examples of this was a very short meeting we had. And these people had a very good material that would be great for a ceramic profit. And they asked to come and see us under great secrecy and, and okay, yeah, great. Come on into the lab. That's wonderful. And so they came in, we signed the NDAs and, and everything like that. And they, they brought out their, their mineralogy and their chemistry. And I said, yes, this looks very promising. And then I asked the question, how much does it cost you to get this material? And they said, $780 a ton. And I go, okay, are you aware that ceramic profit right now is selling for $780 a ton? So there's not much incentive to use this material, transport it, and form it into a ceramic profit if you can't even meet the manufacturing cost or sales price of an existing product in the market. And they thanked us very much and they left and we've been friendly ever since. But that's a good example of where if we'd not been forthright with them and saying, no, guys, you can't mine a material for what the finished product is selling for and make money. Uh, it would have been very painful. So we, we also try to avoid the pain whenever we can by telling people the reality of the situation. Um, no, you don't have unobtainium. And this won't work. So even though sometimes, like Brian said, we can be labeled as doctor. No, people are usually appreciate that a whole lot more than they do if we had waited six months to say it to them. A little bit yeah, of time I think goes it, a long way, right? Yeah. I just add one thing to that, as Carl mentioned. We don't want to be dream killers. And it, it tends right. to be that way, especially from the science side or the you know, the creativity side. And I'm a very creative person. We've designed and developed lots of stuff and very passionate about it. But we also, when we take on a project or considering a project, we look, as Carl said, we look, what's this appear to accomplish, say, six months down the road? Is this going to be something that not beyond the science, but the investors that are asking, where are we at? Where are we at? When do we see some return on the investment? or you won't have a company very long, especially an early stage startup company. And, and just to clarify one thing, Carl said about ceramic profit, and that was the oil field mineralized mention. When he mentioned the $780 a ton, that was years ago. That's long gone. That'd be a third, a third of that price today if anybody would even buy it. And just one added frustration, I would say, Matt, it's really not a frustration, but just a clarification for into ceramics. New company, so to speak, when we lost it, I think there was some, uh, and we would have this opinion too in our former jobs of we'll get a call and says, hey, I got all this material, just come get it. We don't buy, we don't broker materials, and, and that's not what our role is in this, in this area, so to speak. We're trying to marry company A to B to C or to come up with a great avenue, whether it be internally or externally for this material. We had the same deal back in the day, running a plant, and you know we'd call somebody and say, "Hey, don't you need this? Just come get it." And uh, that'd be great. But more often than not, again, it, 
boils down to that magic button I mentioned. If those type scenarios existed, most operations would have found it. So we're not going to we're not going to be the masters of the obvious. We're going to have to put some work into it. Now that that's a very good point, but but there are very happy circumstances when you say somebody no, but we had a we had a client come to us with a waste material, and and they said we'd like to make this we'd like to use this for brick manufacturing. We there's a brick manufacturer right down the road. I think we can sell it to. Them. Okay, so we tested it. Totally unsuitable for brick. Just absolutely totally unsuitable for brick. It looked like a clay, but it wasn't a clay. And we said, no, it won't be good for brick or tile, but it has potential for lightweight aggregate. We are now on the third phase of that project. So a lot of times it's not just no, it's no, but. Right. Now, you guys have obviously been partners in crime for a long time and and obviously complementary to each other. You're co-founders, you, you're, you're, you're still working together. So what strengths do you bring to the team in that sense? I mean, do you, do you ever have to play good cop, bad cop with your clients? Well, we do, but we're real bad at it. <laughs> so you're bad, bad, or you're good, good? <laughs> no, you're too nice we, to them. The, 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 the good cop, bad cop, you know, the very famous routine, uh, we're, we're just not really very good at it. Uh, uh, Brian will call me up and say, hey, I, I need to talk to my real estate agent, okay? You be good cop, I'll be bad cop. I went, okay. And it uh, just always dissolves. So even even though that that concept of good cop, bad cop's out there, we don't really engage in it much. I tell you what we have done, though, from very, very early point in our uh, time of coming together, early on, Carl came into the operation I was working in in Tennessee and the executives brought him in and said, hey, you guys are going to be working together. I want you all to have some time talking. And, and, you know, Carl was giving me a spiel about where he's from, what all he'd done in his career and what he thought his visions and goal were and everything. The executive sitting there that knew both of us very well for many years. He, But we didn't know each other. Looked at Carl and said, now, Carl, don't tell Brian uh, what you think he wants to hear. And, uh, and then he kind of laughed and he said, uh, don't worry, Ron won't tell you what he thinks you want to hear. He's going to tell you what you don't want to hear. And that's kind of the role we've always taken is yeah. that, you know, we, we don't want to deliver bad news, but there is an art to delivering bad news and there's an integrity that goes with it. We looked at minerals recently from Colorado from an associate that knew us years ago in another business. And he was really excited about it. And he said, man, I can really put us in contact with all these various waste streams of this material. And I think, you know, this is just a great, uh, great potential. Okay, send us the analytical data you have. We don't have what we need. We'll get more and we'll go from there. We spent maybe a few hours just looking at it. And we knew that there was no life in our world. Maybe it has potential outside of ceramics, or as Carl mentioned, the things that it needs to go into are already such a saturated commodity market that most of the people doing those products own their own minerals. And in fact, on an operational budget, if you looked at their cost, they may even have materials zeroed out yeah. because they have such stockpiles. So the potential wasn't there. I said, Carl, I've got to deliver the bad news. So next conference call, I just said, we just can't help you with this. And, and frankly, I don't know of anyone that can. And here's why. And at the end of the call, he was like, guys, you probably saved me a fortune of time and money. And I can't thank you enough. Let's find another way to work together. And, that, and that's that's the kind of reputation we want to have. We don't want to have a reputation that's, well, these guys worked on this for a year. And nothing ever came out of it. So we'll go back a little bit to the beginning. I mean, you started out, uh, Brian, by telling us about, you know, boots on the ground experience. You both got a lot of it and you wrote a successful book together called On the Plant Floor um, and OPF Enterprises, your first business uh, named after that. Is there any truth to the rumor that another book is in the works? Absolutely. We may actually have a couple on deck that we've been considering and, and kind of shaping into various content that will actually be a, a book. You know, we've got great feedback on On the Plant 4 since we put it out about 10 years ago. I can't tell you that experience into any uh, unknown authors out there that have a desire to write a book and are just uh, afraid to approach that. Or you've started and you think, well, I'll have this done in 
two months and a year later you're still working on it. We did that. We had the t-shirts for that. <laughs> and we're rejected by 50 publishers on and on and on. First time authors in a super narrow niche lane. But, uh, you know, we've had universities pick up the book to teach manufacturing excellence on. We've had companies, Fortune 50 companies, buy cases of the books just to distribute to their frontline personnel and management team. And we spoke to some of those groups about how to integrate it a little bit better. So that first book on the plant floor, we've actually, over the years of, of doing OPF, have come to the realization that maybe a follow-up or second book in that lane might actually be called Off the Plant Floor. There's certain groups, as we mentioned, whether early stage or R&D or development scientific groups that really should not try to be involved in the manufacturers. Their greatest asset may be that they have developed something wonderful that they need to hand off to somebody else to actually take to commercialization. So that's something we're real passionate about, as well as Into Ceramics. I think we're going to take that into an area to where we talk a lot about how do you get into ceramics? What are ceramics? Covering some one-on-one stuff. A lot of clients that come to us for that primary reason. No. Guys, I don't know what a kiln is. What is silica to aluma ratio? And we're teaching the basics constantly, but also we'll, we'll dig into that series also about specific on the waste streams and where we see value in various minerals around the globe. And companies may pick up that and say, you know what, I'm, I'm sitting on that now. So uh, it's a good thing to know. Brian's a talker and Carl's the writer. So, so what do you say uh, about the books, Carl? I say, yeah, we're going to do it. Uh, and uh, I, have a, I have a few ideas of my own. I, I'm getting very passionate about the Green Revolution and what it means in terms of materials. And, and I remember a college professor I had one time back during the first uh, Arab oil embargo, for those of you old enough to remember that when gasoline went from 19 cents a gallon all the way to 50 cents a gallon in a year and we couldn't get any, then we were talking about, you know, the energy revolution, the energy revolution, you know, so on and so forth. Now I think the passion is going to be about materials because they affect everybody's lives. We all touch them. I mean, energy, unless you don't have it, is not something you really think about. But materials every day, you touch your car every day, you touch your you touch your furniture every day. You touch the world every day. And these are all made from materials. And many of them are made from minerals. And I think we've just got to be prepared for that. So if I have any input into the book, uh, which I think I will, I think we're going to include large sections about what happens in materials. That's a good point. Matt, you said it right, too, because uh, from, from the onset, when Carl and I started the own company, it wasn't Zoom and it wasn't conference calls back in the day. It'd be like, come over here. Or if I did call him on the phone, it would be constantly, I was on the road traveling or an airport somewhere. I would say, are you writing this down? Are you writing this down? I said, this is good. I may forget this. So are you writing this down? And then there'd be sheets and sheets. He'd just throw away because it wasn't any good. <laughs> but between us two, we'll, we'll, we'll put some collaborative effort into figuring out how to put words on paper. Awesome. Well, we're almost out of time, so a couple of quick, uh, quick uh, closing questions here, just to uh, just to wrap things up. You know, if this all doesn't work out, and I think Carl maybe just gave a little bit of his answer to this question, but if you could pick another line of work and obviously get paid decently for it and take care of your families and all of that, what would you choose to do outside of ceramics? You mean besides retire, right? Okay. I guess that's a line of work, and I don't ever see you doing it. So no, I, I, no, I, I really don't see that. If I could do something else, and I, I mean this really seriously because it's something I've thought about for a long time. Brian will even agree with this. I would spend my time teaching illiterate adults how to read. Nice. I, I think that would be one of the most satisfying things that one human can do for another. And impactful. Yeah, great call. How about you, Brian? Oh, yeah. I mean, mine's a lot more selfish, I guess. I uh, I always want to be a musician. I am a musician, but not a uh, a uh, full-time musician. I grew up in, in music as a young child and, and played locally in Bedford, Tennessee. Went to Nashville at 16 years old with guitar on my back and 
and tried to do that for a while and became one of those star musicians that had to find a, another career. But uh, it's just always been a passion of mine, something I enjoy and expose to all the kids. And and uh, so that's it, be a uh, musician. Let's yeah, hope the ceramics industry works out well. Oh, yeah, no. well, the music. That's great. Also, let, right. me, let me just say there that Brian is being very modest about his music ability. Awesome. Well, we'll maybe we'll do a future edition where we get a few tunes. Uh, we'll have a, yeah, maybe you could do a theme tune for the uh, Inter Ceramics video uh, blog post here, Brian. Let's wrap it up in the way that you know I like to wrap up a lot of these conversations. For the benefit of those that have stuck with us and watched uh, the entire episode here, what's something that you want them uh, to know and to take away about about you guys and Inter Ceramics? Well, ju just know that we are a company that it operates at a high level of integrity. We, we may apparently come across and, and be someone that tells you something you don't want to hear, but it will be because of our experience and our dedication to, to look further down the road to see if it has real viability and to avoid all the what ifs that, that seem to deter group. So I, I'd like them to know that, uh, We'll be straight shooters for sure, and we'll be boots on the ground guys to, to help get you all the way into product development to manufacture. Yeah, and I, th I think also we've spent a lot of time saying that that we'll be straight shooters, but what I want people to know is that we're in business to help them succeed. And that's that's really our passion is to help you succeed in your goals. Now, we may help you change those goals along the way. We may get you to think about them more realistically, or we may, or we may align entirely with you, but our, we're here to help you succeed. And that's a wrap. Great stuff, guys. Really interesting to hear you know, where you've come from, what you're doing and, and where you're headed. Um, before we go, quick reminder to everybody watching, please leave a comment on the YouTube page, like the video on YouTube and, and go ahead and follow that uh, into ceramics YouTube channel so we can bring this wonderful stuff out to a wider audience. And until next time, thanks for joining us. Take care.